everybody. Welcome to another Toy Wizards Toy Talk live with special guest Matt LaCroix. Hi, and Matt. I'm my co host, Hi. Lauren Stone. Hi, everyone. And Matt, Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. My name is uh, Matt LaCroix. I run LaCroix Toys. I, I make custom O rings slash uh, some modern uh, customs, but uh, yeah, I'm a toy artist basically. And we love toys. I am not texting. I am sharing this live stream in different groups right now. I have put it in the jungle. I am putting it in Toy Lurker. I am putting it on my personal so that everyone knows that your first time is with us. <laughs> I'm really trying glad to be desperately to share it on another screen here. And it's, uh, it's uh, just not really working out very well. It'll work. It'll work. So all our objective here, everybody, because we only have one hour together, is to make sure that we don't talk over each other because it sounds like toy soup. And this is toy talk. This is not toy soup. So I want everyone to be, be aware of that, right? Or talk soup. Wasn't that? That was a show on E, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I love I, that I really, show, dude. I had the I really biggest crush on John Henson. The yeah. first one. Joe McHale's cool, but John Henson? <laughs> I like well, McHale. Yeah. Greg Kinnear or something do that? And oh, he was the was he the first or the second host? Yeah, he was on it first, and then John Henson took it from him. And I can't remember the John Henson guy, but I remember the Kinnear days. Interesting. Yeah, John Henson was in the late nineties. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was all about Fashion Police with Joan Rivers. That was my jam, dude. I used to get off work every Friday, go get way too much sushi because I lived in this like bougie little town called Sherman Oaks, walk over to my favorite sushi place, bring back like two boxes and just have an experience with Joan Rivers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. She's still around? Is she? Is she <laughs> no, she died. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she, she, I know. <laughs> she died. I always, yeah. I had always thought that that puppet madam was Joan Rivers. Yeah, from Hollywood Squares. Yeah, well, I, she was in her own show back when yeah. I was a kid called Madam. Oh, and I yeah. thought that was Joan Rivers, like in puppet form. And yeah. now that she's passed away, maybe her essence went back in time and haunted that puppet. I don't know. Probably so. That puppet was really creepy. <laughs> I don't even remember that. For a minute, I thought you guys were talking about Sherry Lewis, and I'm like, oh, you know, the one who did Lamb Chop, because they totally went to the same plastic surgeon. Ah. Whoa. <laughs> um, um, so this is obviously Toy Talk. So um, uh, let's stop with the puppet references and get on to talking about toys. Sounds good to me. Um. The big news on Toy Front, which I will be writing an article for Monday, is that Brian Flynn of Super 7 made a statement that don't buy Lionel and Panthor at the eBay prices, which are $160 to $255 for a figure. Wait, because they're working on making a second run. Um, which is great news for all you Thunder Tank guys are like, well, I don't want to buy a Thunder Tank if I can't buy a lion -O. Well, here's your chance to buy lion -Os again. This will come up soon. Um, I want to think it's going to be like the variant for the Wave 1 of the Turtles, where they will be the same figures, but maybe a slight paint variation or box variation, something to set it apart from the first version. This lion -O figure and, and Panthro both were already released by Mattel, years ago then super seven and now super seven is going back to make a second run of lino and panthro most specifically for people that want to buy thunder tank and want to have the lino and panthro to, to to you know crew that enormous machine that we yeah. still have another month and a half to pre-order that thing's huge yeah it's fantastic it's is seriously it like i'm sorry getting, Oh, we're doing that, what she told us not to do. Be yeah. um, watch each other's body languages, gentlemen. All right. Uh, Snake Mountain. After we got Snake Mountain, I'm like, there's nothing will ever get greater than this as a toy. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I still have like a four-foot Sentinel and a Unicron on the way. And now a Thunder Tank. 
And as much as we thought the golden age of toys was 1986, it's really looking that this 2000s were actually getting more incredible toys than we ever got even in the late 80s. I would agree with that um, with most lines for sure. You know, like the Masters of the Universe Origins. I love those. Those are amazing. I was, I was going to ask. So, Matt, before we deep, deep dive into the customs work that you're doing and how influential and present you are in the G.I. Joe community, what is your current relationship with contemporary toys, contemporary collecting? Is your Are your fingers to the pulse? Where What's your headspace with all this? Well, I'm not flatlining yet, but uh, I, I kind of pick and choose, you know, like what Scott was talking about, about those Thundercats from Super 7. Those are amazing. I, I, I could definitely get into those. Um, I collect some of the origin stuff. Um, of course, as you know, I'm a big G.I. Joe guy. And, you know, when the retro line was, when, re when it was revealed, of course, I was disappointed. It was just modern figures calling it the retro line. But, uh, you know, retro they did packaging line. retro packaging. Yeah, they had to kind of do some damage control, I guess you could say on that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, everybody else, Mattel, uh, Super 7, they're doing great. I, I applaud them for their uh, their homages to the 80s, for sure. Speaking of homages to the 80s, one of the pieces of toy news that was announced in the last week was from Icon Heroes announcing that they're going to be making a bunch of Hasbro lines such as Power Rangers, Transformers, G.I. Joe, and My Little Pony. What was funny about that announcement, Scott, you and I have been covering and following Icon Hero for years because they're present in the convention scene, but I think it was the first time hearing of this company for a lot of people. Do you guys being that you're both huge G.I. Joe fans, what sort of G.I. Joe things would you want to see from this company that primarily does pin books and bobbleheads? You want to go, Scott? It's certainly, uh, you know, Pat over at, at Icon has an idea of certain things that he can make easily. He's got a playbook and he's going to use that playbook. And then, but, you know, whenever you are making certain things out of there, what else can I do? And that also depends on your license. Like, even though you have a license to do G.I. Joe, you don't have license to do G.I. Joe figures in certain scales. Mm. But, so there's a lot of play with that. I'm sure whatever they do do, um, it will be off the cuff stuff. It's stuff obviously Hasbro doesn't want to make. Otherwise, Hasbro would make it. Um, I think it's kind of neat that they're licensing themselves out to Super 7, to Icon Heroes, to all, all the other places that they're doing licenses through and getting a lot more product out. Um, I think it's just beneficial to us fans that we can now pick and choose what we want to buy rather than buy the only thing that's made. You know, And I think that's the big change. I Do totally you guys... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, what Scott said right there, I, I totally agree with 100%. Well, then do you guys think so? Because I see, I actually have a lot of G.I. Joe, like fan made pins, enamel pins, fan made enamel pins is a huge business, Etsy, craft shops, conventions, and, you know, independent artists. Um, you know, to segue it back into the work that Matt does, do you, you can, you can drink on camera. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, um, so to segue into the work that you do, Matt, do you think that the presence of, additional new licensees, licensors, licensees by Hasbro for G.I. Joe stuff. Um, do you guys think it'll kind of get in the way of the custom fan work or do you think there'll always be a place for that? And so, and tell us more about the customs that you do specifically, Matt. Well, um, I think the reason my work is thriving right now is because of the absence of the O-ring figure. Um, I'm sure if someone were to be able to, you know, whether it be Hasbro or this other, are they considered a third party uh, company or they're, I don't no, know. Icon, Icons is just a, they, they're, they have an actual license. So that makes it non third party. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> they are a third party. Yeah. So the reason my work is, is uh, doing so well, I believe is because of an absence 
like collectors are trying to fill a void. Like I'm mainly focused on making uh, certain characters that were never available uh, through the original uh, A-Ra line, you know? So that's my main focus is, is doing characters like that. Like once a man, you know, working on Pythona right now. I mean, it's just stuff like that that us as kids never got, but us big kids now are like, wow, these would really fill some holes in my collection or fill a void in my collection. So I'm just trying to do the best I can. And, you know, I'm, I'm just a big fan myself, you know, just trying to get things out there for people, you know, that, it, that appreciate it. You're a fan with a very good mentor. Talk about your mentor. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, that would be Bill Merkline. Um, he is definitely my mentor. Um, our relationship started maybe a year and a half, almost two years ago. Uh, I just reached out to him. And as an artist, you know, he, okay, first let me say for folks that don't know, Bill Merkline was responsible for over 70, I believe, of the original a Ross sculpts, you know, made in two up scale, which is like a little over six to eight inches, somewhere in that ballpark. That's how they sculpted the original ones. But anyway, he, he made some of the most iconic Joe figures. And I'm proud to say that I consider him a friend and a mentor. I call him just about every week and he, I send him my artwork. He's not on the internet. So I have to mail him photos huh. of, of the work I do. You know, the, he's getting close to 80 years old. So he's just a great guy. He really took me under his wing and he, he taught me tricks. Like um, he was going, he actually did sculpt the Rocky Balboa uh, figure that Hasbro was going to release if they could have afforded to pay Sylvester Stallone what he wanted to be, you know, a sponsored character or whatever. But uh, he did initially do a sculpt for that. And I told Bill I wanted to do the Rocky Balboa and, um, you know, release it as a small exclusive run, you know. And so he coached me through the entire thing, uh, doing the head sculpt. He, he told me, okay, wait, that doesn't look right because, you know, Stallone's nose needs to be longer. His cheekbones need to be up more. He just coached me through the whole thing. In, in this relationship, I, it's a dream come true for me because if I never go any further in this career of toy making, I'll, I'll at least know that I had him, you know, as a friend, which is what it's all about for me. I so. think you're going to go a lot farther. I, yeah. Yeah, I uh, on my personal side, I got to work on the movie Tron Legacy. Oh wow! Yeah. And um, I'm a huge, huge Tron fan. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I got to work on a Tron movie, <laughs> as you know, being raised up as a kid, and I got to meet and know and get to know the directors of the old and the new, mm. and you know, for them even to like you know, uh, to correspond with and whatnot. I, I felt that, like, you know, it doesn't matter what I do now, from now on, like, whatever I do, it doesn't matter, because I got to work on Tron, so um, I've I'm, I'm been very happy with that uh, as my career point for painting and, and development, so. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's like, you know, dreams come true, really, yeah. for sure. So I have a question directed at both of you gentlemen. So Matt, you were talking about the O-ring and wanting to preserve that sort of toy making style from, you know, the childhoods, from, from the nostalgia. Um, what do you think other than, other than nostalgia, what are the benefits of keeping the O-ring in toys? And when you and I were kind of talking on the phone the other day, you know, we were discussing other toy lines, Mego, et cetera, that had the same like rubber bands. What what about it more than nostalgia keeps the O-ring interesting for you? Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Lauren, because um, I'm actually working on a toy line. Actually, Scott painted one of our, our paint masters for us. Uh, it's called Strike Force Alpha. Uh, a buddy of mine, Jason Schirmeyer, and I are, are trying to launch a Kickstarter pretty soon, and we've got most of the prototypes done. It's kind of ironic, because I know on our conversation, I said the O-ring, I love it, it's great. But this 
this actual figure, and Scott can vouch for it, he's seen it in hand. It doesn't have an internal O-ring, but the exterior looks just like what you would expect an 80s O-ring style figure to look like. Even the front and back torso screws together, you know. And but that's that's the point I think you have to keep in order to, to make the whole brand follow through is not just the scale, because it is an off scale, but also the ability to screw the, the chest together so that you can hot swap parts out however you want. And that's exactly. something that um, Mattel listened to. And when they redid their origins line, they made sure that the body parts can hop swatch around so they mm -hmm. can build, you can build your own human figures as well. I think that's really important to your your you know GI Joe compatible line. Mm -hmm. um, is that oh well if you don't you want these arms on another dude you can take them off. And exactly. That's one of the things that made GI Joe so popular in the later years of its of its run because you could buy a figure and just take them apart and make a new figure and people still do that today and you've even mm -hmm. built a, a side business based on that fact that you can swap parts around. Exactly. Yeah. So I have a question for you, Matt. Um, in the beginning, when you first, first, first started doing customs, were you doing that? Like, were you taking old figures, swapping them around? When did it happen? When did the leap happen that you started getting parts made? Because you showed off that vat full of purple parts the other day, didn't you? Mm -hmm. So yes. when, when did when did that leap happen from? Dennis, Dennis is making those right now. Dennis it's Dennis. Yeah, I knew it was Dennis. <laughs> yeah. But is that how it started for you when you first started making customs? Were you swapping things around and simply repainting? Absolutely. That's that's how we all started. Like Scott was kind of saying, you know, when when we were kids, you know, just swapping parts and repainting. Of course, back then I was probably using a Sharpie or something, you know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> nail polish. Sharpie's work is a very good black on G.I. Joe's. Mm -hmm. really yeah. do, especially like Flint's beret would always get scratched up. You just hit it with a little Sharpie and you were good to go. Oh yeah, for sure. But it, it, it just uh, evolved, Lauren. Uh, you know, it was like, hmm, I don't know how to put it. The first big thing I really did as far as sculpting goes was the once a man Cobra commander because of course, I relied on the existing parts, but I really Frankenstein them, sanded them down, sculpted over them, you know. So uh, from then on, it, it progressed to, okay, I want to do another, I want to do a run. And I've done uh, like Commando, I did that, I did a Judge Dredd, you know, a few on Instagram. But uh, some of the parts, a lot of the diehards can recognize but I wanted to make things where, even if it was like a, a torso from uh, from uh, Shockwave or something, I did something like I, I, I flipped the knife around where it's not upside down and, and added a couple of grenades. You know, I, I did like little tweaks to it. So it, it all depends on your your uh, what character you're going for because uh, a lot of times out of the arsenal, you could, out of your parts bin you could scrape something together to make a character but i, I wanted to go take it a, another step further than that you know with unique head sculpts and things like that so uh, it, our fans gonna see more of the once a man that was huge <laughs> you're like that's I mean, a, ha, ha, no i don't want to answer that laugh i'm jewish i know that laugh <laughs> <laughs> fans <laughs> I think so. Yeah, it's it was just it was just something that really uh, it was like my uh, my swan song kind of thing, you know. And it's like uh, gonna have to bring it back. I mean, I can't just you know. There's there's a lot of people that hit me up every day still wanting one. Yeah. So I don't think it'd be fair to say no. Nah, I'm never gonna do it again. So it was a Halloween thing for 2019, right? Yeah. If I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, but if I do it again. It's not going to be the same exact colors, you know. I mean, it's going to be close to that, but there's going to be some special benefits of it. I'm going to do it. Uh, well, I've already done it, but I've made a removable helmet 
for this one. Okay, oh, cool. so that's going to be a, a nice feature. His his uh, reptile skin is going to be a little deeper green. So yeah, I mean, we got to bring Coco back for sure. <laughs> that's awesome. It's a superb figure and a superb choice of one of those things that we did not get that we should have gotten in the toy line um and it also brings the thought that final wave of figures that we didn't get from gi joe where they had the aliens busting out of people's bodies yeah and uh cobra commander was on that line along with snake eyes and a couple others right where the alien was bursting through them and i think if we would have gotten one more year of G.I. Joe, I think it could have turned the entire line around. Uh, yeah, I would have to agree. I know I'm like agreeing with everything you say, Scott, but mm -hmm. right on the same page with you there, I, I think it would have progressed into that. Um, yeah, I would have totally bought in a uh, Cobra Commander figure if he had that reptile face. Even if the <laughs> helmet had just come off and given us that reptile face, I would have been all over it. Oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of the appeal of this one that I did. Um, I, it surprised the heck out of me because I've always been more, when I was into the Joes, I was the kid that liked Duke and Flint, you know, um, not, not more, I mean, I love Cobra. Cobra is so cool. But when I did this, it surprised me the response that uh, I got from it. I, didn't, I had no idea it would be so successful. Now, let me make. I let me just that, add one more. What's that? I think in the G.I. Joe community, there are G.I. Joe collectors, but those Cobra collectors are a little more manacle because they're always, they're the army builder guys. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I may have an army of shipwrecks, but that's because I have an aircraft carrier and I need a lot of yeah. sailors. But yeah. in, in the Cobra community, like, Oh, how many vipers do you have? And if you if that number is under a hundred, you know, then you're like, oh well, you're not a real cobra collector. And they look up down to you because <laughs> I've seen collections where there's you know 300 vipers and in, in in crimson guard and like the army building is huge for that that part of the GI Joe collector. Absolutely. Matt, now, what were you gonna say? We can continue your point. While we're still on the, I don't want to just cocoa this, cocoa that. I don't, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but that that one last point I'm going to make about that figure is he's kind of a double-edged sword because uh, I also, not only was he quite successful, but I also caught a lot of flack for that figure from uh, previous customizers that had done a similar type of uh, figure. which Ooh, was gossip. It really was kind of odd. I'm just kind of throwing it out there, but uh, yeah, I was like trolled over it and stuff. It's really weird. You know, in the in the toy community, no matter what you do, good or bad, you're going to get yelled at from the other side. And all you have to really do is just stick to what you want to be doing and go forward with that. Um, we had discussed, you know, earlier on where you know Super Seven's going to make more Thundercats. Mm -hmm. And people are hating on them for making more Thundercats. But then the same time, people are hating on them for not having Thundercats. Like, you can't win on either side of that fence. Yeah. You have to just do what you think is best and, and take that line and go forward with it. Amen. <laughs> yeah, right. Keep on trucking, you know. I'm going to keep doing this. It's yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. It's really you, There's no way to make everybody happy. And uh, Brian Flynn has told me that several times. He's like, I don't read the comments. You know, I can't make everyone happy. I'm just going to keep doing what I think is best to make the best toys I can make. Yeah. Uh, creating content, be it a physical toy or internet content, writing, video creating, is putting is, is opening your, your heart and having people pour, chest in, pour salt in your chest cavity every day. You mm -hmm. just keep going. Yeah, just keep going. <laughs> just keep going, bruised, bruised or not. I want to actually ask you, uh, Matt, about your foam work. When I, when I, you and I first became friends, I remember on your YouTube channel you were putting out a lot of, um, a lot of videos about your foam work and mm -hmm. sort of play sets and dioramas you were making. What's going on there? Well, Lauren, uh, that 
was very fun and that was an interesting chapter and I can't really juggle doing the figure thing and the uh, dioramas at the same time. I would love to revisit and do some more of those. And I still have folks, you know, want me to make, com you know, commission work, make stuff for them. That was interesting. And it, I just, uh, I'll probably make more again if I ever have time. <laughs> but, you know, because they're really time consuming. <laughs> Yeah, doing the brick work and all that stuff. I mean, wow. You know, it it sounds to me like you choose to sleep instead of make stuff. What and am I thinking? He has personal experience. Sleeping only gets in the way of getting more work done. Says the guy with no kids. <laughs> Don't listen to him, Matt. Thank he doesn't you. know what he's talking about. Thank you. Yes, I got four of them. Uh, got four of them. Yeah, three, three, three of them are triplets. <laughs> yeah well we have it any other way you know we, no I'm, I'm, your, your family's beautiful we love our families it's just um i've said it before about my own kids which is and i only have two is more like you learn to be very efficient with very small bursts of time because it's all you have <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly yeah I mean, it's it's really that frightens me when I'm doing an 18 hour day already. And then you guys say, well, no, you don't even have time for that. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we don't have time to make choices. <laughs> yeah. My, my pesky day job gets in the way of a lot of stuff too. I, I, I just wish I could make toys 24 seven, you know, it could but, be coming for you, man. Oh, <laughs> let's talk about some of your commissions because as we were talking about a little bit ago, um, your commissions work has been, increasing i see your i see your posts on facebook being like hey everyone who ordered commissions like thank you i'm getting through them like you know i i know that it's, it's ramping up for you and that's so flipping cool have you received any very unique commissions requests yet mm. i did uh here recently i did zanya are you guys familiar with i know scott knows who that is from the yeah the Devil's Do comic. It's like how I make the heart wrencher with the Zorana body. The one back here. Um, I made Sonya, which she has a green, uh, and she's got like dreadlocks that are kind of they go back. But the interesting about interesting thing about that one was he wanted me to have her with nipples. So uh, I knew that was coming. I was gonna say, have you gotten the request for like, can you take a Baroness body, take off all the paint, and just leave her like that? No, no, I, I don't think I could ever do that one, but yeah, it was tasteful. I got to say it was fairly tasteful. I don't know. Scott, but, do, you re do you, Scott, do you remember the story that Jay Sullivan told us? All right. So we're our friend, Jay Sullivan, who is a GI Joe, IDW GI Joe cover artist, um, said that he got some flack from somebody because he would not paint, you know, he would do commissions, but he would not paint like Baroness or any of the girls in compromising positions. And, you know, that's where he's, that was his stance. He's a father you know of two what? daughters. That, that stance was just limited by the money being paid. There's a there point that stance goes away. At a certain point, you can offer X amount of money and that stance goes out the Bro, window. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. I got offered $15,000 to lick someone's face because of my long tongue. And I still said, no, dude. I'm like, I don't want to die. I don't want to be murdered. <laughs> wow. But, but that was $15,000. And I said, no. What happens when it's 25,000 or $100,000? There's a point when that goes out the window. Let's talk about Matt's custom. Talk about your custom. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> anyway. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, no, I know you'll be doing um, toys full time because like, you know, as going back to the topic at hand, your customs um, requests are going up. I've seen you more using the banner LaCroix toys as opposed to Scorch Earth. Tell us about the transition and what's happening with you. Okay, so that is pretty much Jason Schirmeyer and I had agreed that we'll use Scorch Earth as as kind of for the uh, strike force alpha line, but I was still doing my own thing, you know, with the customs. So 
I don't know how it came about, but somebody said LaCroix toys and they were like, I got to have me one of those LaCroix toys. So it just kind of stuck and it's very simple. It's straight to the point. It's me. So there you go. It's LaCroix toys. No, it's perfect. Yeah, that works. I'm just, I'm just rolling with it. But I got to say that all the folks that do get commissions from me, I'm so thankful to each and every single one of them because they're always so patient with me. I, and I keep them updated. Communication is, is key here. But I'm always giving them progress. And then, like, I've got this other side gig. I'm doing some painting for Dime Novel Legends. I, you know, God knows he does a lot of the, you know, paint masters and stuff. But, dude, this is my first gig doing this. So I'm, like, really nervous. You guys know how I'm kind of nervous about a lot of things. But this is, like, a legit gig for me. So I'm trying to, like, wow him. And uh, it's going good. But on the other hand, everybody's been super patient with me. I love all my folks that want my work. I always strive each and every time to make it the best that I can that I'm capable of, you know? So thank you to everyone. That's awesome. Yeah, the, I mean, the work you're doing is phenomenal. Um, I may be partial to that babe with the tiger stripes. Yes. You made a toy with me. That's, that's you, bro. That's you. That's, that's all you. <laughs> that's, thank you. And thank you. Like, I... Dude, thank you a million times over for like, for that, for thinking of me, for, for like seeing me like that, like you're a true friend and yeah, to just um, be seen as like strong and, you know, in toy form, I really, that's cool. I really appreciate that. Thank you. You've been immortalized in plastic. So. It's better than being immortalized in late, anyway. <laughs> you got oh, around you But, uh, yeah. All right. You know, I've I myself have been working in the toy community for a long time now, and it is something to get used to. Like, oh yeah, I make toys. Like, I forget sometimes. Like, you, right? Like, how many toys I've made over the years? I've lost count. Like, I can remember mm -hmm. at times back when we still had Toys R Us, and mm -hmm. I'd walk through Toys R Us and I'd be like. Oh yeah, I, I painted that like was that two years ago? Like I, I I literally have created toys and just did it as just as a job, just every day working on toys that I've even forgotten about toy lines that I've worked on. Wow! And then you have the toy lines that you worked on that you remember because you're very fond of them, and mm -hmm. then the toy lines you're like, I'm not even gonna mention I painted that one. I'm just gonna keep on walking and just you know that's the job. You're done. Uh, I want to get there, Scott. I want to, well, I won't be walking through Toys R Us, but I want to get there one day like you. <laughs> it was really nice for a long period of time that I could walk into a Toys R Us and always find a toy that I've worked on. That's... And there was a span of like 10 years where that was possible. Like I, you know, every, every day, every time I went to a Toys R Us, there was always something in that Toys R Us that I had painted. And uh, it was a really, really great feeling. And it's something that we won't see again because the stores will never carry the toys like Toys R Us did. And that's why we're having so many issues in the toy community that we are right now. Yeah, it is a shame. Yeah. On the topic of Toys R Us, let's turn this back to a toy news angle. And then I have a question for you, Matt. So we learned the other week that the only two true kids, which, you know, Toys R Us, that opened in malls in the States have both closed due to a lack of foot traffic. On Toy Wizards, we've been following the saga of Toys R Us since they shut down when the IP was sold uh, regrouped as True Kids, the two stores opened, and now they shut down. And I've been going on and on and on in articles about the reason they shut down, because they're all just Melissa and Doug boutiques. They're all just selling, like, wooden toys, tchotchkes, Legos, baby dolls. There's tons and tons of um, demographics that are and age groups that are left out. So to turn this back to you, Matt, you're a father. Um what where do you go these days 
to to when your kids are you know in need of a new toy how do you scratch that itch like i used to just take my kids to toys r us and walk around for an hour on a hot day we had nothing else to do on a very hot day um and when they were really little and so i couldn't take them to the park so i'd let them get their energy out at toys r us granted this is years ago your kids are a little older than mine like we we have those memories what do you do for your kids and also what are they uh, what what do they what do they play with if i may ask unless you don't want to talk about your kids i don't take it personally no it's it's totally fine and uh i'm sure everyone with kids can kind of relate that you know a lot of it is you know technology and uh um, just like iPads and things like that. But I do get my kids involved with kind of what I do. You know, they, they want to, they want to paint, they want to make things. I encourage their art. Um, they, but tangible toys, like I'll go to, I'll take them to Target and sometimes they find something they want, some Legos or, you know, things like that. I don't walk down the action figure aisle too much because I don't want to fight somebody over like a Cobra uh classified figure or something like that you know <laughs> no I mean, kids are i know that a lot of people say it I, I still think kids could could be into toys you know but um there is a lot of the technology involved too but you know it's like you said walking around getting them out you know we play I've got a school that's like walking distance of our house. We go play basketball there and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, they're not like they're not like me when I was a kid. I was like Thundercats, He Man, all that, you know, because we had the the cartoons and stuff too. Of course, my, I, you're going to be proud of this, Lauren. Uh, my boys are really digging Inspector Gadget here lately. Yeah. Hmm. It's pretty awesome. They make Auntie and, Lauren proud. Yes, yes. That's you awesome. You have an inspiration of that because I'd seen your posts about that cool set you got in the video about the cool set. And and I was yeah. like, I got to teach these boys who Inspector Gadget is. And they really love it. I love those old Deke cartoons. They were so digestible. Oh, yeah. Love, love Deke good cartoons. Animation. It's good animation. Good animation, you know, because the, um, the boards, you don't think so? No, I, I, Deke the was kind of were known good. for being the bottom of the barrel for animation studios. They would promise a lot and then always never provide what they promised. Oh, so, man. Deke is, you know, as much as you might fondly think of certain shows, if you look at the animation quality of the other studios and then you look at Deke, Deke was like the poor man's animation studio. Don't you crap talk, Haim Saban and Shuki well, Levy? Don't. Well, Scott, I think some of the probably some of the best episodes of Inspector Gadget, like you, you ever seen how some animations vary, like in the same series? Like I think that's some. Where, of them that's where they were farming it out to different studios. Where sometimes, uh, sometimes they were using the U.S. animators, and then sometimes they were farming it out to Japan. And then those US animators episodes came in, they're like, wow, oh, this is fantastic. And then the next episode, you're like, Am I is my glasses on? What's, uh, what's going on? And that happened where, with that in the animated series too a lot, didn't it? It it's a common issue with the very close timelines to get things animated. And mm -hmm. then when they do changes and they send them, and then the changes don't come back sometimes, and you're like, yeah. Well, what are we going to do? And um, I've been listening to this book by Flint Dilly, who worked on all of the Sunbow stuff and just did everything you can imagine during the 80s. And the reason why in humanoid episodes were so small is that when they would ask for revisions, they just wouldn't get them sometimes. Mm. They're like, well, yeah. we have to have the cartoon out. So that's why they built these larger before and after things where mm -hmm. they would talk about just the character using flashback animation because they had that and they had to fill those minutes out one way or another because it had to make it, you know, on Thursday at nine and that was it. Or it wouldn't be on Saturday morning. Like they would cut those lines so close. And if they got screwed by the animation company that they paid, to do that, there wasn't a lot of recourse. Yeah. 
that makes me think of um, a story from my friend. I have a friend um, named Carl who's now in his 60s. And his first gig was, I think he was storyboarding on Shira in the 80s, you know, Filmation Shira. And he has these stories that they um, were challenged to create as little new animation as possible. And if they could make a full episode, 20 minutes or so, of all reuse, like they would get a high five. Like if you yeah. could completely not draw anything new, then it was a, you know, yay, yay budget. Yeah, uh, Filmation, when they got the He-Man contract, this is a great story. They walked the, the crew through the studio and they showed all these animators at desk drawing. None of them were animators. They were all actors that Lou had paid to look like animators so that he could get the contract to hire animators to do He-Man. And that's what he did. He had fooled them with actors and then got the contract and then had to hire everyone out of LA that could draw to be animators for He-Man. And that's how we got the He-Man cartoon. Yeah, like, wasn't Filmation like the kings of stock footage? I mean, you'd have He-Man like... Yeah, yeah, they, they rotoscoped, yeah. you know, the very basic elements and then reused those as much as possible through He-Man and She-Ra because they had to do a lot more episodes. He-Man was the first series to be, um, man, I can't even think of that word now because it doesn't even make sense anymore. But it was the first one not to just be on the main stations for Saturday morning, but it was the first one to be syndicated. There we go. I was going to say, yeah. It was the first cartoon to be syndicated mm -hmm. across all of the country. So they needed to do five episodes a week for mm -hmm. so many weeks, which is why there's so many uh, uh, episodes for He Man. And that's yeah. where they had to cut costs just to, to do what they said they could do. Wow. Yeah. It was yeah. an exciting time in animation in the 80s, that's for sure. Animation in the 80s, man, and the yeah. PSAs, dude, you know, had to have the, the public safety announcements at the end. I think they had to walk that fine line where they weren't just advertising toys to kids. They had to throw that in there, too, right? They were absolutely purely advertising toys for kids, and that's why we don't see these cartoons on anymore is because it, as a paid commercial for toys – it no longer makes sense. And the last cartoon for that was Green Lantern and Teen Titans. Teen Titans and Green Lantern both got their episodes stopped because their toys weren't selling because the cartoon could not bring enough people into toys. And the reboot of Thundercats also did not get a second season because toy sales were not helping out the animation costs for that cartoon. But that's a really good point, Matt, about how in the 80s, um, those forced PSAs were in there to make it like, look, this isn't just all about selling toys. Like, <laughs> knowing is half the battle, man. We say it right here. Yeah, we care pork chop sandwiches, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it was just to sell toys, absolutely. Well, then we have things like in the 90s, like Captain Planet, which was not to sell toys, but it was an environmentalist propaganda machine. So it's like, okay, if you don't have a toy agenda, now you have this like, propaganda agenda so yeah there's i don't know entertainment's good though i don't care i think people are too hung up about how other people enjoy entertainment like and that you know that's kind of what's happening in the toy community too i'll segue into that we talked about this before scott that right now the world seems very very small and everyone's too concerned about what other people do and how oh, yeah. people enjoy their toys and how they enjoy their media yeah. and it's really like like not this, not to you guys, but it's like get out of my get out of my room, like get out, get out of my. Phone. Yeah, I I definitely see a lot of comments in the forums about toy shaming, and that mm -hmm. well, if you don't take your figure out of the box, you shouldn't buy it. Like these toys are meant to be played with, and I open up all of my toys, and you're just a stupid scalper for not opening your toys. Or then there's people like me that buy multiple copies of toys. Well, you shouldn't buy multiple copies of toys because you're then taking a toy from me or another collector. And it's like, dude, these toys are here to be bought. I'm going to buy them. If I see it, I want it, I'm going to buy it. And that, that even, even earlier, what you were saying about like having 
300 vipers um you know having all those that army like you can't even say that in today's climate because it's such a trigger it was like when cobra island wave one came out if you showed that you bought more than two you were under fire because i don't have one and you're stealing from me right now because you have more than two and that's a viper people are going to army build that and now that we're getting our supplies from the reissue cobra trooper everyone mm -hmm. that's got that reissue cobra trooper bought like six to twelve to twenty like they bought a ton of cobra troopers and people are still mad at them for buying them like you bought too many and i couldn't get it it's like dude that pre-order window was like four months open you could anybody that wanted to buy a cobra trooper right now could have pre-ordered one through Big Bad, Hasbro Pulse, or Entertainment Earth, and got them this week. Um, and you're complaining that you can't get one. Well, you should have pre-ordered it. And there was a ton of pre-orderability for Zartan and Cobra Troopers. And Zartan that we're finding out was on that ship that sunk. So we do not have our full Zartan allocations, and therefore he's coming up a bit short. For the meantime he will keep coming out people can calm down but there's a lot of like very much worry that we can't get our zartan figure because he's only showing up for certain pre-orders because everyone else has to wait for that second shipment of zartans yeah yeah well here's my interesting take on like like let's say classified for instance you know these these prices and everything you know people paying the ridiculous prices for this and that but if people are willing to pay it you know sell it for that i guess but do you guys feel like with those prices do they hold their value you know what i'm saying like a year from now are they the, really not going to really be that hot the real thing about gi joe prices is that it's a brand new line yeah and it, as much as we say well i i've been you know gi joe forever the classified line's a brand new line. They had no idea if it was going to be good or bad. Like, was it going to sell like it's selling now? Or was it going to sell like Ghostbusters on the on the pegs at every target? Mm -hmm. They didn't know. Nobody knew. And yeah. even with the, they've hyped up the production, Zartan and Cobra Soldier, they took pre-orders for a long time. A lot of people have got Cobra infantry now. Mm -hmm. And going forward like flint lady j major blood barbecue they're all going to be a lot more available than that wave two or some of the exclusive cobra island figures mm -hmm. um will it get is it going to be worth a lot more money deck in the future the big thing is that people cannot wait to find their toys i mm -hmm. gotta have my toys now yeah right now and i see people i can't find Zartan. he's been out for like a week or two yeah like, i right. just got my zartan in the mail i'm doing my review tomorrow morning i just got him and mm -hmm. people are panicking that they yeah. won't get their zartan and that the game's over and i'm gonna quit collecting gi well, joe's because i just can't get what i want the week it comes out welcome to a new world you're not going to let that happen you have to pre-order you have to hunt i hit seven walgreens today not a thing hmm. not a damn thing not a silver surfer not a gi joe in fact i didn't even get the trail mix i wanted there they didn't even have the trail mix i wanted it's like a special <laughs> brand that i can only get at walgreens and they didn't have that. So it's it just how supply and demand are. And you have to be patient and you have to plan. But as so many people don't plan or be patient, that's when the toys suddenly just start skyrocketing. And then they blame, well, scalpers are driving up the price. It's like, no, it's that guy in Kansas that just doesn't want to wait or doesn't want to hunt. And screw it, I'm gonna pay 50 bucks for a Firefly, more power to you, you know? You got your Firefly now for 50 bucks, I'm willing to pay 40, you know? That's just how it goes. I won't pay 50, I'll pay 40, or I will eventually find one in the store, but I still don't have a Firefly, you know? I want one, I got 
one viper the first week it came out i will get more vipers when this second release comes out and that's just how things are going to go until supply catches up with demand and then when supply catches up with demand they're going to complain that they're only there's only the brand new wave there's nothing but alley vipers and bats on the pegs and i want my baroness version two and crimson guard gear you know like they're always going to find something to complain about we just have to just you know do the best you can and realistically be happy collecting toys because it makes you happy if you're stressed out about collecting toys i don't know what to tell you man because everything else in the world is much worse than buying toys right <laughs> amen to that you know, my take, my thoughts on it is basically, it makes me think of the current situation, not to get, I'm not getting political here, we're talking about toys with Gina Carano and the Cara Dune figures. Now, yeah. online, online, you know, the, the, basically the second that, that she was let go from Star Wars, I wrote an article letting people know, hey, you should collect these because in 20 years, this is going to be a story. And of course, people, you know, think with their emotions and they go like, uh, either people are like, F her, I don't want to collect that toy. Or they're, or they're like, eh, you know, I'm, I, it'll, bleh, and I'm not thinking about tomorrow. Um, Target's has them on clearance. Hasbro's canceling production. Now, um, you know, eBay has them for a hundred dollars for a three and three quarter. So like, again, you know, Target's clearance, you know, uh, the aftermarket's expensive, Hasbro's canceling. I think what I'm trying to get to, to answer your question, which was, what do you think about people paying, you know, inflated prices, is people have lost the ability, and I don't know if it's because of the pandemic and our health climate, or I don't know if people are impatient, like Scott was saying, and just need everything now. Nobody can look at what tomorrow is going to look like. And the only reason that we can find grail items at toy shows is because somebody was kind enough to take care of it in their closet, in their storage, in their wherever they take care of the toys and bring it out 20 years, 10 years. But let's look at five years, guys. Like, let's, let's start small. But everybody's so worried about today and tomorrow and this narrow, narrow picture of I can't find my NECA cartoon turtles that they freak out and yell and shame instead of remembering that the only reason we have a collector's market is because collectors took care of this crap for us. So buy Cara Dunes. I'm telling you, dude, I ordered plenty. I, uh, again, it's a, all a part of history and the story of toy collecting and that specific franchise. It's important. Well, Lauren, now do you see why I feel like the 80s was the best decade? Because none of this mess would have happened back then. People getting butt hurt over everything these days. I mean, only so many people are going to have different political views. I mean, I'm I'm kind of a centrist, you know. I kind of weigh out each situation. Uh, like I'm not getting into politics either, right? But I have friends that are crazy. It's crazy, but they're on both ends of the spectrum as far as political views go. And uh, I don't know. That's why even back in the '80s, you know, you had you know, Democrats and Republicans were kind of reaching across the aisle. You know, you don't see that anymore. I mean, things went nuts infamously during the holidays. Everybody will always cite the Cabbage Patch Kid thing. There's always been times when yeah. toys are hot and they spike. That's true. That's true. But, 90s Power Ranger toys were absolute nuts in the 90s. Right. There's wow. always spikes and moments. But now it feels like every flipping toy announcement is a spike and a moment and it's exhausting and it's because of people our ages um you know like collecting toys you know or it's people i don't know exactly you know i can't i can't pinpoint exactly what it is people people love to say that kids don't play with toys we have discussed kids and toys a couple minutes ago my daughter's room is a mess right now. I, that girl plays with toys. It's a scene yeah. of toys. And she plays with them all. So, you know, I always, I, I don't mean to go on a ramble tangent here, but you'll always find the kids that like, back when we, when, you know, we were young, like I always had a stack of books and some kids didn't read. You guys, we also, we all had our Barbies, G.I. Joes, Motus, whatever we played, we had oceans of them because we immersed very hard in that imaginary play. 
And then you had people who were like, I don't play with toys. I freaking play baseball only. Just people. We, we need to stop being so hard on each other. Agreed. It's, it's, you really should have fun, whether it be toys, whether it be art, whether it be reading, whatever it is, have fun. And if you're not having fun, find something that makes you happy. Um, we are we are down to our last five minutes. I've been uh, we, are diligent, we are diligently not keeping you. We're not keeping you. We're not gonna we're not gonna eat up all your family time. But um, Matt, is there any t talking points that you would like to bring up? And if not, you can let people know where to find you. But is there any is there anything that you want to share? Um, no. Uh, I appreciate once again. I appreciate the experience to be able to share with you guys. Uh, I just want to say that making customs for me is more like I've got this outlook like I don't want to just make customs. I want to create icons, you know, like when you look back at, of course, I'm going to refer back to G.I. Joe. When you look back at the Sergeant Slaughter figure, it's so iconic or like Lion O, Thundercats, you know, that's what my goals are is to make something that's iconic, you know, and uh, that's about it. And You're doing great. You're doing it. You are. Yeah. Yeah. Where can people find you, follow you, and buy lots and lots of customs from you? Well, I'm I'm on both uh, Facebook and Instagram now. I'm Lacroix Toys on Instagram. You can come check out all my work there. Reach me uh, through private message in both face. My name is Matthew Lacroix. You can hit me up on either platform, basically. So that's about it. Perfect. Any closing thoughts, Scott? You know, Matt, uh, I just really want to say thank you for coming out on the show. Thank you for this time. I know we've we've all been talking to you privately for quite a while. It's nice to have you on the Toy Wizards. And this is our new segment, Toy Talk with Toy Wizards. So uh, from me and Lauren, thank you very much for coming out online. Um, for everyone else, go find him on Facebook, find him on Instagram. You can find me and Lauren on every platform imaginable and mm -hmm. toy dash wizard every day for toy content and check out our YouTube page where we're really pushing out a lot of stuff on both toy wizards and pop lurker. So thank you. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We're, we're, we're doing a lot here for you, especially since we're all trapped in, in, in pandemic land and the COVID closed box house we're really trying to push out a lot of content to keep everybody enthralled entertained and i can't find a third word that starts with e energetic content no, that's that's ecstatic right. there we go i can't believe our hours up i had a lot of fun that was fun yeah. right i told you you'd have a good time yeah. nothing done to be done. worried about i'm, All right. I'm huge fans of both of you guys so it's really an honor to be here. Thank you. No, I love your work, Matt. You're like you're just an amazing person, friend, artist. Just thank you so much for what you're doing. All righty. Well, thank you everybody for watching. Remember Toy Dash Wizards every day. Toy Wizards on YouTube or on Instagram or on Twitter. I'm Scott Zilner. I'm Lauren Stone. And this I'm is Matt LaCroix. There we go. Thank you, and we will catch you guys later. Bye. Bye.